thank the Lord as y'all move forward. Well, tonight, uh, uh, I thank the Lord. First of all, I thank the Lord, uh, uh, praise God for calls that music. Uh, for the revival last week, God is good. You know, give God a hand. Praise God. I was shown his favor, his power, his anointing. So it's awesome to see the great things that God is doing, that he continues to do uh, through the uh, student body of Christ and the vessels that he chooses to use. And tonight, uh, there was a topic that was on my mind three months ago, and I wanted to do something. Um, uh, it's called Staying on Purpose. And it was something where I wanted to men and women of God who uh, have been growing in the Lord and who the Lord has been grooming for ministry to be the ones that uh, would get up and speak. And I decided to kind of break it up. And tonight it's, it's going to be me and uh, a really good friend of mine that was a former uh, student body of Christ vice president for two years. An awesome woman of God. God definitely uses her. Uh, I remember a time when uh, Kevin one day, and they didn't know where Kevin was, and I wasn't here, and, uh, you know, because Kevin would think, you know, if I'm not here, we'll just, just have Antoine teach, it doesn't matter, you shouldn't be looking for me, Antoine will just teach, but I wasn't here because I had to work, and then B. James wasn't here, so people were just going to go ahead and say, man, yeah, just cancel the Bible study, and Leslie got up and said, no, we're not canceling the Bible study, she just got up and just taught the word of God, just got up, and this is what God is talking about, see guys, but you don't understand this, <laughs> and she got up and taught the word of God, and Kevin, they finally got hold of Kevin, Kevin was on that slate ministry. <laughs> and he woke up and was on the highway going like a hundred and got here. Came in, caught the tailwind of what Leslie was talking about. You know, I heard about it because I was at work upset, man. Like, man, I can't stand this work, man. The Lord gonna get there for this. Vengeance is his and he gonna repay back for having me out of place right now. But uh uh she definitely taught an awesome word, so the Lord has definitely used her. Um, she definitely has a word tonight. We both have a word tonight. I'm excited. I've been excited all week. And so I'm excited about what she's going to share. Um, but I wanted to first uh, introduce that so you guys know. And I also wanted to take a second just to give God praise. Because uh, I hear recently I celebrated. Uh, I didn't celebrate officially, but I, I'm going to celebrate this weekend. You know, I'm excited. Um, it's been officially 10 years that I've been part of the student body of Christ. So I've been celebrating for 10 years. Years ago, March 2005, you know, I was uh, 20 years old, y'all. Had the young baby face, had the uh, braids that was to come. I definitely needed the Lord, y'all, back in those days. But uh, God delivered me. I came in, I sat in that Bible study. That one Bible study, I never stopped coming. I never stopped because it was what I needed. And to this day, I'm still here 10 years later, and God has done awesome things. So I just thank the Lord for allowing me to be part of this for 10 years. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pray. And after I pray, uh, Leslie's going to come up and she's going to uh, deliver the word again. The topic of tonight is dealing with staying on purpose. And after she goes, I'm going to get up and I'm going to teach. So uh, uh, without any uh, further ado, we'll go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the gathering. God, we thank you for another awesome opportunity that you've given us to be here. God, we thank you for your mercy and grace that allowed us to get here safely. Father God, there's so many, God, that got into accidents, oh God, who didn't have an opportunity to get to their destination safely, God. But we give you thanks and praise, God, that you saw fit to allow us mercy and grace to get here safely. We take time out to tell you thank you, God, for watching over us, Father God, on the highways and the byways. You're an awesome God, you're worthy of praise, Father God, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the sun. It doesn't matter what we dealt with before we came in here, God. You are worthy of praise despite our problems, our issues, people who got on our nerves. God, you're worthy to be magnified and exalted for being an awesome God and providing for us, God, when we didn't have a means to provide for ourselves. So we thank you, we bless you, we are magnified your name. Now, God, we ask tonight, Father God, in the name of Jesus, anoint your servants, oh God, to speak to your people, God. Cause the flesh to sit down that the Spirit may minister to your people in this hour, Father God. A word in season, Father God, for those, Father God, that need a word from you, Father God. Bind every distraction, every hindrance, Father God, every devil that would dare. Hinder the word of God from prevailing, God. Cause your word to prevail in the atmosphere, Father God, in the name of Jesus, God. Shut down the enemy, Father God, in the atmosphere, in the name of Jesus, God. Walk through, God, and feel free, God, to say what you want to say, Father God. Use your vessels, 
Father God. We are your instruments, Father God. Use us as you will, Father God. Glorify, magnify yourself. Cause your word to destroy your yoke, Father God. Cause your word to confirm, Father God, for your people, Father God, what you have been speaking in their hearts, Father God. Let them know, God, that you heard them, Father God. That you heard their request, God, and you're moving swiftly, God. Have your way tonight, Father God. We'll give you the praise, honor, and glory in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Without further ado, if we can all give a hand to Leslie as she comes forth. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I'm glad to be here. Um, so I just, you know, not much has changed with Antoine, who always goes in hard, starting to get started off right. Um, but I was actually, I was vice president and treasurer, so, you know, just to slide in mind. But just to clarify, I don't want to call for any offense, just as Brittany who served in that place. Um, so, Antoine told me tonight was, you know, staying on the purpose and just kind of looking at what it is about what God has set us forth to do. So I'm opening up with Romans 8.18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So God's purpose for us, right? We Staying on purpose, I'm not going to lie, it's going to be difficult. It is going to be hard to be a Christian some days. It's going to be hard to keep the victory. But we've got to know what our purpose is. So I just went straight to dictionary.com. Here's purpose. The reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. So you are here for a purpose. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So when we're looking at the purpose of being a Christian, our number one purpose is always salvation. That is the key. So when I hear people talking about, Jesus, when are you going to send me my husband? Or I want a date. Or I want to do this. I'm like, salvation is it. That is your purpose for being here. There is no greater thing than salvation with Jesus Christ. So that is what he died for. He didn't die to bring you a husband. Um, you know, I know I said a little critical because I'm married. <laughs> but I just know that I know what it's like to be young and be in the seats that you guys are sitting in and thinking there are so many superfluous things that I was worried about as a college student. And it's easy to lose sight of why we made it in in the first place. And that is that is the ultimate goal is to reach heaven and have salvation. You know, our, our other purpose is winning souls, right? So it's not just for us. It's not like a secret fishing pole that, you know, we've got this good spot and we're going to keep it a secret. We're not going to tell anybody else. We're going to tell everybody. We want to win souls. So Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So if I had to say what the purpose of being a Christian is, it can be boiled down into these two things. Thank you. So now we know the purpose, but how do we stay on purpose, right? That's the whole point of tonight. So especially when the going gets tough, but God said, but he who knoweth the way that I take, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth his gold. My foot hath held his steps, his way I have kept, and not declined, straight from the mouth of Job. And if anybody knew what it was like to stay on purpose, when it was hard, it was Job. Job, his wife even said, just curse God and die. Like, this is too much. <laughs> like, you know, and I I haven't been where Job is, but when my husband failed nursing school, I'm like, <laughs> I had to pull it together and be supportive. I'm going to support my husband. That's why he's coming home tonight from Illinois, because he had, you know, that's just where God took him. But things get hard, and so who is your partner in life going to be? Who are you going to surround yourself with as friends? with fellowship, who are you going to be with? Because somebody might just say, curse God and die. So you have to be careful with who you surround yourself with. But we do not serve a God who is incapable of knowing the sufferings. Job trusted God for what he had yet to reveal. So Job was in the Old Testament, but he was trusting God for what he was yet to reveal in the New Testament. If we look at Hebrews, it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was tried on every level. So while we're talking about staying on purpose, keeping our salvation, winning souls, and we know it gets hard sometimes, but there is not a thing that you will go through that Jesus doesn't know. When you're sitting in your room by yourself, on the floor, on your knees, crying out to God, he's been there. He knows it all. He's already done it. He knows everything. He has set the path before you. So when you're like, let me go confide in this person, or let me go confide in that person, or let me seek out, social media is the devil. It's the worst thing because people will put their 
they will put every problem out on social media and then get mad when people give them advice. Well, what are you putting it on social media for? Like, why are you posting that on Facebook, Twitter, this, that, and the other? People are going to give you some good advice. People might give you some wrong advice. But really, the only advice you need is from God. Yeah. Have counsel with Him. And the people that you get counsel from should probably be walking with God, too. Because not everybody has your best interest in heart. But what I love about this scripture, it says, Yet without sin, at all points were tempted. Jesus suffered some of the most severe persecution than anybody in this world. And last weekend, or, <laughs> I lost the victory. I was at soccer, whoo, on turf. My wrists are all burnt up, my shellac came off, my knees are scraped, and I, I lost the victory. And it just came out of my, some unsavory things came out, and even more unsavory things. I'm like, I burn all over, turf burned everywhere. I'm like, I lost the victory just from taking a dive on some turf. But Jesus, Jesus went through some persecution, and he held it together, and he stayed strong. Without, and that means he didn't even, when people were whipping him, when people were taking the scrouge and ripping open his flesh, his bowels exposed, not one foul thought did he have towards any of them. So when people come at you with negative things, they're going to say rude, offensive things. People are just going to pour out, not even knowing they're being offensive. People are going to say stuff, and it's easy for us to think some things when people do that, right? Or even failing a test. I went to a teacher one time, I'm like, I'm in the textbook. Right here is my answer. And he still wouldn't change it. The thoughts that came through on my head as a college student struggling, right? <laughs> and it's right there in the textbook. Right. Nothing. He didn't think one foul thought. So when we look at all the really the trivial things that we experience in life, Jesus, he already knows. So turn to him. Give it. So he stayed on purpose, right? So if we think that Christ was not challenged to be on purpose, so most of you are still thinking, well, I'm not Jesus, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not God in the flesh. But if we look, at, look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Three times in the Bible we can find three different versions of Jesus saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. So Jesus not only suffered, but he also... If he could have had our salvation for us without having to suffer, he would have chose that way. But it wasn't God's will. So it's not to say that he doesn't even know how it's hard and to not want to do things. Sometimes we have to do some things that we don't want to do. Right now, Brian's wife is killing me at the gym. I'm like, Jasmine, I can't. My ass. She's like, two more. You can do it. I'm like, I can't. I really, I really can't. <laughs> it, will, it will be tough. <laughs> I'm like, if I could get in shape without having to do this, I would, but I can't. So that's just to show you that Jesus has been there. He's been in situations that he didn't want to be in. So even as far as I can do this, God, but not my will, but your will, Jesus knows every trial and suffering that you will ever experience. He's done it all. He's not one of the Pharisees or the high priests to sit down with a silver spoon in their mouth and tell you about overcoming a hard and difficult life. He's not out there judging you saying, you know, I always look, you know, when election times come around and they're coming up soon about how people will, you know, they'll sit there and say, well, you don't need food stamps and you don't need this and you don't need that. I'm like, have you ever been poor? Right. What, are you, what do you know? You've never been poor, so who are you to say about people living in poverty? But Jesus isn't like that. He's not going to condescend and look down on you. He's going to lift you up. Right. And he's been there and he knows it. Next slide, please. Thank you. So when I talk about it being hard, don't delude yourself into thinking that this walk is easy because you will set yourself up for failure. I got the holy, I got the power of the Holy Ghost, but girl, some trials and suffering are going to come. I promise. And the Bible tells us to be prepared for that. The Bible doesn't give us any illusions about the Christian walk being easy or not being difficult. If we look at it, it says, "Enter ye in at the straight gate." For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and there and many there be which go in thereat. So don't fool yourself into thinking. We read the Bible. That's why it's important to stay in your word, because all of a sudden you come up out of the baptism pool praying in tongues. I'm like, it took me a whole year, so I'm not going to judge. But, <laughs> but some people do that, and they get so super saved, and they think, I've got this Holy Ghost power that there's, there's no thing. It's just going to deflect. No weapon formed against me shall prosper, and they just walk head up, not looking blinders on, straight ahead, and all of a sudden they stumble. Well, you weren't looking out for the trouble. You weren't prepared. You didn't have your guard up. So you always got to have 
that mm. is brought up in the Bible warns us that straight is the way. So if it was easy, it wouldn't be a narrow path. But for the good that I would do, but the evil which I would not that I do, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present in me. So you have to constantly stay, if we're looking at winning souls, if we're looking at salvation, you have to stay in your word. You've got to fast. You've got to pray. You've got to fellowship with saints because when, when your flesh gets the best of you, if you, don't, if you don't feed your spirit, that flesh will go grow strong. And it will get the best of you. And that's how we stumble. If I would have been in more prayer, I might have said, ooh, I'm just glad I can feel that turf burn, that I've got the feeling in my arm. <laughs> <laughs> but I, didn't. I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared. So, you know, I stumbled a little bit. But we have to look. The flesh is weak. So you've got, you've got to stay in it. So you will be tried and it will be hard. But you have to stay on purpose. So I look at this scripture, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comfort us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. So I say, thank God I don't look like with what I've been through. Right. To, weak, or, to the weak became I his weak, that I might gain the weak, and I, made, and I am made all things to all men that I might, by all means, save some. So if we're looking at salvation, saving souls, it's hard to stay on purpose. It's hard to walk the Christian walk when you look sometimes over your life and all, God, why did you let this happen? Why did I have to go through this? Some of us have had some really terrible things, not just breakups or my car broke down, some real, I failed a class. We've been through some stuff. And I think back when I was talking with some of my um some of my girlfriends the other day about if you really know, I know this is a new crowd of people that I'm not familiar with all of you, so you don't, all don't really know my testimony that much, but when I got to college, it was like a whole new start. Nobody knew me. I'm going to put on this facade. I'm just going to pretend like I've never been poor, and nobody's going to know. I'm going to go get the Bear Bradley from the gift store at TUC. <laughs> so, nobody's going to know. And when I met my husband my freshman year in college, he, you know, we are getting to know each other. And he told me, yeah, my parents got divorced when I was in high school, and it was really tough. I'm like, I'm so sorry, your parents got divorced. And then my only time I ever went home from college was between my freshman and my sophomore year of college, and my then boyfriend came to visit me. And he called me and said, I'm 30 minutes away, and I kid you not, <laughs> my brother walks up behind me, spaghetti stained pool bowl, eating cereal, and he's <laughs> like, What's the matter with you? Like, he doesn't know her white trash. <laughs> he has no idea. He has no idea. I never let it on. I never told him. But what didn't come out in the wash came out in the rinse real quick. So when I look over my life, I'm not just saying I had these experiences for no reason. He walked into my house. I'm like, we're gonna keep it. We're gonna keep it together, family. Come on. <laughs> come on. Come on. Everyone on their best behavior. He wasn't even there. 24 hours, I could see my mom. My neighbor came over to tell my mom that my uh, brother had cussed him out in the driveway. And so I could see my mom's little bipolar. Um, so I could see her escalating and building up, scrubbing the wall. There's not even any stains left on it anymore. Just scrubbing real hard. And I'm like, this is going to be bad. So my brother walks in the door, and he's not even in the house 30 seconds. My mom picks up this bottle of lotion and chucks it at his head, and Pat's like, what's going on? I'm like, oh no, my brother tries to walk away. My mom gets him with a shirt over his head, starts hit wailing on him. So my brother slams her down in the chair, and I'm like, I've got him by the waist. My brother wrestled varsity heavyweight as a freshman, so he's a big boy. Around the waist, pulling as hard as I can, yelling at Pat, get out of my house! Well, he's trying to unlodge the butter knife that had our door locked shut. <laughs> and, uh, um, just out of my house. Like I would if I could, but I can't. <laughs> Police came, they got their tasers out on my brother. Well, he had made it out, but then it was even just the icing on the cake. He had some pot on him, so he had to come back and hide that. And as he was in the driveway, the cops pulled up behind him. <laughs> Tasers out on the ground. Pat's never seen any anything like this. Uh, anything close to it. And I'm like, oh, he's gonna run for the hills. 
So the cops, my brother gets arrested, they're taking him to the detention center, my mom's on this tirade, and my grandma about 15 minutes later pulls into the driveway. And my mom's off walking down the street smoking, trying to cool down. <laughs> she just looks at Pat's face and said, mm, what happened? I'm like, they did it, Grandma. I try to keep it together, but it's all out. Like, she's like, well, Pat, are you staying or are you going? <laughs> and he stayed. By the grace of God, he stayed. But the reason why I tell you this is to let you know, we have to go, go through some experiences so we can relate to people on a different level. So last summer, I went to Haiti. I mean, went to an orphanage with girls that were referred to as Rustabak, which means that in some manner, shape, or form, they were being trafficked, trafficked before they had been brought in off the streets. So these girls had been sold out for prostitution, they had been sold out as servants, they had been, to any number you can think, they had experienced it. Experienced it. So probably about ages 5 to 16. And so I looked going into this situation about how am I, has this, really this educated white American is going to go into this orphanage and minister Jesus to these little girls about who have these horrible experiences. But then I remember the one time that my aunt had me by the throat choking me out, and I'm like, oh yeah, I've been there. <laughs> so when I look back over my life and things that I used to be bitter about, I could not say God can bring you through that. And God can bring you through that. He brought me through it. He can bring you through it. I've been there, and you are going to make it through. So when he talks about how we go through things to comfort those in the future, when you have something, whether it's trials, tribulations, past pains, whether it's something you're going through currently, know that your trial is for a reason. You are going through for some reason or another, so that way you can relate to people, whoever you might meet. Right now, you guys are on a college that has roughly 35,000 people on it, give or take a few. You are never going to be in a place where you have more opportunity to meet souls, to win souls, to cross cultural boundaries and color lines. You will meet more people here than what you will ever meet in your life. And now is the time to get people why their hearts are tender and fresh before they get turned over to that reprobate mind, before they become hardened and bitter while you can still reach them. Now is the time you will never have an experience like what you have now to reach people. Thank you. Thank you. So when I look at what God says about having hope for salvation, about continuing, why do I go out and witness to people? Why do I go on mission trips? Why am I trying to win souls? God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He also said, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. So when I look at God, when I look at salvation, and sometimes it gets hard, sometimes witnessing to souls, especially when you're going through something, is difficult. But God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's got plans to prosper you. He has plans for you to go and do abundantly. He died so you can have life more abundantly. He has plans for each and every one of you to do great things. Whether it's to be the usher at church, you might win 50 souls up here at church and win no souls up there as an elder sitting in the chair. You have, it doesn't matter what your position is, what your station is, it matters how are you going to let God use you and what value are you going to put on that. So we've all had to go through something because there may only be one way for us to connect with a person and share that gospel. So when I look at that connection that I had to make to these girls and then I look back over my life, why was I abused? Why did I have to suffer? Why did I have to go live with my grandma? Why are my brothers in foster care? Because when I go to an orphanage, they need to know that I can relate and I can connect to them. So whatever it is you're experiencing, you have, you have experienced past hurts and pains, but look at you guys, you're on college, you're also experiencing elevation and success and education, so you are going to be able to relate to people on multiple levels yeah. throughout life. So don't be bitter and hurt about trials and suffering because the prize is salvation and we are here to win souls. So stay on purpose. Yeah. That is all I've got. <laughs> when I was first thinking about this and I was meditating it on it three months ago, I came to Leslie and I talked to her. I said, you know, I want to have a wild week. She said, what's a wild week? It's a women of the word. 
And uh, you're one of the uh, four women that I want to have get up and teach because I know you have a lot of experiences with a lot of things. And um, I wanted to see if you'd be available and willing. She's like, yeah, just let me know when. You know what I mean? You know. And um, it's awesome to see what God has uh, done in her. And you see, we uh, God is growing people. And you never know who's sitting in the midst. Um, but God is planting his seed and he is growing his people, his men and his women. You never know who's in the midst of you until you uh, God points you out. And when God points you out, you get on up and God uses you. So I thank the Lord for Leslie. She gave a powerful word about staying on purpose. Now, I didn't even call, I didn't call her, y'all, all week. I tell, all I told her was staying on purpose. And what I'm about to talk about, she didn't went ahead and was just confirming. <laughs> Go oh, ahead. I know we without the Holy Ghost. That's that Holy Ghost right there. I ain't said a word for it. So you better go ahead and confirm what I'm about to go ahead and say. God better have his wife. I'm going to preach to the window for, for, for no reason. And them, them towels and them curtains. The Lord, they confirmed it to her. So I thank the Lord for God using Leslie. And uh, so God is truly good. And mine's going to run pretty quick. I know you told me sometimes I tell y'all, oh, it's going to go pretty quick. And you know, y'all might say, this not going to go quick. But that's why I got a job to keep me on point. So it's going to, it's going, mine's going to roll pretty quick too. And mine as well is staying on purpose um, with the subtopic, quitting is not an option. Mm -hmm. Quitting is not mm -hmm. an option. Staying on purpose, quitting is not an option. Um, John, you can go ahead and hit the screen. And from what, what I went to, uh, just dealing with, with the book of Nehemiah, just to give y'all a breakdown of what was going on in Nehemiah. Uh, the people had been enslaved, the temple walls had been torn down, and the people were just in a disarray. And Nehemiah was just discouraged in the Lord. He didn't think, he didn't think that they could uh, recover from what it was that they had went through. And he just wanted to give up. But God, it's something about when the Lord stirs you up and gives you a desire to get back on purpose and get him to do the things that God calls you to do. And God puts it in his heart to start rebuilding that which has been torn down. And we're going to see here as I run through this why it's so important to stay on purpose and how, just as Leslie was saying, there will be people that will get in your way of staying on purpose and doing the things God has for you to do. So we're going to jump into it, y'all. I'm going to run through. This is like 16 verses, but I'm going to run through because some of them run together. Verse number one, now it came to pass that when Sambalot and Tobiah and Jeshem and the Arab of the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, Though that at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. Now understand that these people right here were the enemies of the people of God. And they found out that there was somebody who was concerned about the building of uh, Jerusalem. The place where God's name was. And these enemies came about to come out and try to see what was going on. And they really, they laughed him to scorn to see this man out here trying to rebuild what's been torn down and trying to do this work for the Lord. And verse number two, it says, And Sambalot and Jessam sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Onan. But they thought to do me mischief. This is why it's so important to stay on purpose. Because there is an enemy that wants to do you mischief. He does not want to do you good. He wants to do you mischief. But it shows how important it is that when your mind is stayed on the Lord, you're able to discern whether what somebody is bringing to you is something of good or whether it's mischief. He discerned that this person wanted us to, these people want us to gather together. Really, they're coming because they want to stop the move of God. They want to try to sabotage what it is God is trying to do in my life, what he has put in my spirit to do, to rebuild that which has been torn down. He is coming to try to sabotage what God has started in me. I put up there an example of a young woman, and it's funny, uh, when I think about uh, Leslie, this young woman I'm getting ready to talk about, Kendra, was the one that brought Leslie, well, witness to Leslie, and brought Leslie to the Bible study. Kendra was a young lady who was homosexual. She was out there. She had the young, I don't know, Christopher, tell me. I don't know what it was. I think it was a young Jeezy chain. She had the hat backwards, the baggy pants. You couldn't tell that she was a, a young woman. You know what I'm saying? She walked like, talked like a dude. But she came to the Bible study. People loved on her. She kept hearing the word, kept hearing the word, and as Kevin was preaching that word, and one day she said, man, I'm sick of this lifestyle. Man, I want to be delivered. I want to be saved. And she got baptized on my birthday. And got her money. <laughs> 
aware of what's going on because the enemy wishes to do you mischief and if you're not aware of it he will try to sabotage the purpose and plans God has for you and Leslie uh, not Leslie but uh, Kendra had this desire to keep witnessing to this guy and one day a good friend of mine Carl who I wish a lot of y'all would have had a chance to meet him. Carl was a cool man of God. He was, uh, he, me, Chris, and him, all of us was light-skinned and we wore glasses. Everybody <laughs> thought we were brothers. Carl was about 5'7", but he was older than all of me and Chris, and we all just hung together. Carl would just eat, pray, go to class, and go home. He wouldn't do nothing else. Ever. That's it. He just was focused on Jesus. And one day, we was all together when Kendra was with this guy, and Carl, and this is why the Holy Ghost is so important, it's staying on purpose. Carl was walking behind this man, and the Holy Ghost revealed to him this spirit that was on this man. And it was a rapist spirit. He had an objective to try to rape her, and he wanted to try to sabotage what it was that God had begun in her life. And he called me up, and he let me know, after this, that God had revealed this to, to him. And he said, man, we got to go over. She cannot be spending this one-on-one -on -one time with him because he has an objective. He has a plan to try to sabotage what God has started in her life, to try to get her to think that, you know, once this happens, why would God allow this to happen to me? But God revealed it to him, and he told me, and I told one of the other guys, and this is why you got to pray for your brothers and the Lord. I told one of the other guys in the Bible study, he was one of them football player type dudes was ripped. And I told him about it, like, man, we got to go over there. You know what I'm saying? Because dude thinking about he going to try to do something to her. And he's like, oh, no, nah, man, ain't nothing going down over there. We're going to go over there. We're going to fellowship with him. <laughs> anything go down, you know, we all going to pray together. And if anything manifests, we going to pray. God, give me the power to not whatever show up all the way out. Because it's like, dude, we ain't going to knock nobody out. We're going to make sure that she's safe and that he don't do nothing else or whatever plan that he has. But he had his mind some work. But ultimately what happened was he didn't get to do what it was that he wanted to do against her because the Lord had revealed that he had a plan of mischief. He had a plan to try to sabotage what it was that God put Kendra on his campus to do. This is why we have to not only always stay prayerful, but that we have to always not always get mad when God cancels plans and things we may put in place. Sometimes things get canceled just to get canceled, but sometimes things get canceled because God blocked it because there was an enemy that had an assassin on assignment to take you out. You may have had, there had come a change of plans and you might be upset about your plans that got changed. You sitting back there upset like, man, God, why did these plans get messed up? I had plans to go to New York. I had plans to go to Chicago. I had plans to go to Carolina and go up to Dayton. But you didn't know that the enemy had an assassin who was on the way and God had to send a storm to block what it was that the enemy was trying to send your way to try to take you up. That's why one day I was sitting back and the Lord had to deal with me about sometimes not always getting upset when people is running late on Sunday. And I'm sitting there like, man, this person will come on out of this place. Like, man, we got to go. And I don't realize what the Lord was dealing with me with is that sometimes you don't have to always try to get there or be in a rush because you don't know uh, what it was that I may be uh, keeping you from. If that person, or the, let's use my brother, I love him, I'm going to use him as an example because he came in my spirit where I was working on this. I love him though. Let's say, for example, Deshaun is running 20 minutes late coming downstairs. You don't know 
uh, what it is, and if had he come down 20 minutes earlier, you don't know if you would have took off in that van and maybe you weren't paying attention. If you'd have came around that corner, there was somebody who was going to be speeding through, coming at 60 miles an hour, and they were going to hit the van and they were going to take out and possibly sabotage or paralyze some people. You're not thinking about that. You're just thinking that Deshaun running late, but you don't know. I may have caused him to be running late right now, and it's working together for your good. So sometimes you need to just slow down. I'm reminded of. One day when I left out of Sunday school, y'all, and I went to go get some breakfast right after Sunday school, and I was at Kroger, and I was, um, I got my food, and I was getting ready to pull out, and this person was taking all day, and I was waiting for them to move so I could leave. I'm like, man, Bishop, I'm almost done with the, with the, 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 you know, the commentary and the service. I can start, I'm like, I don't need this person to move. And I was getting ready to pull out. And as I was getting ready to pull out of this Kroger that's down there towards uh, Galbraith Road, I was getting ready to pull out, and I heard, I heard in my spirit, uh, wait. And as I was coming to the light, the light was red, and it was getting ready to turn green, and it turned green, but something in my spirit said, wait, wait. And I waited just a couple seconds, you know, people get behind you, they start blowing, let it go, man, what you doing? And, but I, I pulled up to the light, and I waited one or two seconds, and somebody, I didn't even see because of the bushes, you can't see stuff. Somebody came racing through the light. They had to be going like 70 miles an hour. They came through the light so quickly. But if I would have pulled out like I normally do, I could have been paralyzed because I saw it in the eye of my mind. This is what could have happened to you. This is what could have took you out. This is why we need to always take time to thank the Lord for divine protection. Because you don't know what God is protecting you from. You up. Even when you didn't even have your mind on the Lord, the Lord had his mind on you. When you was on your way to go do some nonsense, the Lord had his mind on you. When you was on the way to go to the club with your fly boy outfit on or some Gucci mama outfit, and you were getting ready to go do some nonsense, God may have blocked something to keep you from being destroyed because he had plans for you. The enemy had plans for you, but God had greater plans for you. That's why it's so important important to stay on purpose and understand that the enemy means to do us mischief, but we got to stay on purpose and not quit and understand that the enemy is out to take us out. And this is what ne uh, Nehemiah understood. He understood that these people are only wanting to do me mischief. They want to stop the movement of God. They want to stop what it is that God is trying to do in my life. That was a lot. And so... Verse number three, I'm going to speed this up. And I sent messengers unto them saying, now look at this, y'all. This is what it is about staying on purpose. As Leslie was talking about staying on purpose, he sent a message back to the enemy. This is why you got to sometimes, you can't just let the enemy dictate stuff to you. You got to dictate the word of God back to him. He said, I am doing a great work, so I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I start leaving and come down to you? Showing that what the work of the Lord is having us do is more important than what you want to talk to me about. The work of the Lord is more important. I can talk to you in some other time, but right now, I got to be about my father's business. My father's business is more important than your business. Ain't no business more important than your father's business. So he sent that word to let the enemy know, I'm doing a great work. This ain't just some any type work. I'm doing a great work. This is a work that I will be rewarded for for eternity. It's not just some temporal thing that I'm just doing on a campus or I'm just doing at work just so I can get some simple, silly award and people to get my name on a wall somewhere. Like at my job, all these people that have been at this company, I'm at this corporate office working for this corporate company, and all these people that exact has been there for 20 years or 30 years, like, yeah, you know. Yeah. Even they work hard to get their name on that board and all that stuff will mean absolutely nothing when they stand before the Lord on Judgment Day. What did you do for the Lord? You got your name on that board for some nonsense, but did you do your father's work? Did you do your father's business? I don't want my picture up on that board. If anything, my picture's going to be up there. It's going to be doing some work for the Lord. So it shows us, Nehemiah teaches us that when we're doing a work for the Lord, we have to stay focused on the Lord. I put up there an example about text messages because it shows when you stay on corporate purpose and quitting is not an option, you have to make sure that you stay on that purpose. And when you start something, you have to finish what it is that you start. I started in 2008 uh, sending out some text messages. It just was put in my heart to just start sending a word of the day every day to a handful of people. 
back in 2008, and this year will be seven years. I've been sending out every day, Monday through Saturday, not on Sunday, because I'm expecting the people going to church and getting the word. I'm not going to send you a word. I'm in church getting the word, so I'm not going to send you a word. But I started sending out to this handful of people, and it has grown to this mass amount of people. And one day, you know, some saints, you know, you know, they might change. They don't tell you they change their number. Some will just change their number and not tell you. And you texting them thinking you texting that person. And then some saints, you got to pray for your brothers and sisters, y'all. And so I'm sending out these text messages. There's people all over the world who I got these numbers connected to. People that's in Texas, California, wherever, Atlanta. And I'm sending out these text messages, and there was two examples, two people, one particular that I'll talk about, that I was sending out these text messages, and it was like Wednesday or Thursday, and somebody texts me back and says, you know, who is this? And I'm like, oh, this is that one. Isn't, isn't this such and such? No, no, this isn't such and such. I said, oh, okay, my bad. I thought this was such and such. Oh, they must have changed their number. I'll go ahead and take your, your number out of here, and I'll stop sending you these messages. And they said, well, actually... I've been going through some things this week with my family and uh, things going on on a job and all these struggles. And I've really been struggling with my faith right now and, and believing God almost like to the point of wanting to give up. But even though we don't know each other, um, what, I, what I'm asking is even though we don't know each other, if you could please Keep on sending the messages that you've been sending all week because everything you've been sending all week has been confirmation to me that God has not forgot about me and that I should not give up. the fact that it is God confirming that he ain't forgot about me. He's thinking about me even if he has to have somebody who I don't even know send me a text message and I'm somewhere in Texas somewhere and you somewhere wherever else. We ain't got to know each other. The only thing that matters is you're my brother in the Lord. That's the only thing that matters and you're confirming that God has not forgotten about me. This is why we have to make sure that we do not quit and stay on purpose doing the things of God. And this is what Nehemiah leaves and he lets him know that I can not come down from doing the work of the Lord. Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. This shows you that the enemy we're fighting, y'all, is relentless. They sent this four times, and it lets you know that the devil will not stop. He will keep over and over and over again trying to get you off of purpose of doing the work of God on the campus or wherever ministry God has put you in. He wants to get you off. If he can get you to a place where you're ready to quit, then he has got you. He's got you thrown off from what God has put in you because what God has put in you, he can't, he can't block or hinder what it is God because once God has planted something God planted it before the foundations of the world so if he if he was going to try to stop he'd have to go back before the foundation and he can't do that because only God is sovereign only God can uh, write something and speak something so what he can do is try to discourage you from operating what God has called you to do discourage you making you to think that you're not good enough you're not a strong enough man or strong enough woman you can't do this look at your past for you let me show you all this stuff that's happening in your life you're not able to do these things four times that he keep coming back. But again, you guys, this is why when Leslie talks about you got to know the word of God. You got to respond back to the enemy. And he said, as he said them the four times, I answered them after the same manner. I said the same thing. Every time that devil came and said this to me, I said that to him. Every time he said, look at what you did here. You did this and you did that. Well, devil, let me tell you, you did this and let me tell you where you're going. But I'm going to tell you where I'm going. You ain't got a chance, but I got a chance. You can remind me of my past, but I'm going to remind you of where you're going. Right. So I'm not going to allow you to hinder me from the work that God has for me. Quitting is not an option. Now for the convenient Christians, quitting might be an option. I talked about that this summer. There's a difference between Christians and convenient Christians. I'm not a convenient Christian. If you don't know what a convenient Christian is, a convenient Christian is a Christian that decides to be a Christian when it benefits you the best. If it does not benefit you at that time, then you would say, I, I'm not a Christian right now. I'm just, you know, I just believe, you know, God loves all of us. But if it's going to benefit you to be that Christian, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I love, I love the Lord. I ain't going to identify who the Lord is, but I love the Lord. I can't be a convenient Christian. I have to be one that serves the Lord. And Nehemiah was that type of man of God who rebuked the enemy. He did not allow the enemy to sabotage what it was that God was doing. 
Then sent Sabalot and his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time. Again, enemy ain't stopping. Like he will use people to try to hinder what it is that God is trying to do in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. Where was written? It is reported among the heathen. And Geshem said that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee in Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall be reported to the king according to these words. Now, therefore, let us take counsel together. And verse 8, Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thy own heart. So the fifth time, Sambalot sent this message saying that you're trying to do this work, you're trying to do this work for yourself, you're trying, to, you, you're trying to impress people. You're trying to make it like you the king. And that your ruling. Look, man, look, let us come together. Let us talk about this. Let's not go and tell the king about what you're doing. And it really shows here when Nehemiah, he rebukes him. And it lets him know everything that you're saying right now is coming out of your own heart. It's coming out of your own deceitful heart. Jeremiah 17 says that the heart is deceitful and above all else. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Lord said, I, the Lord, I search your heart. So the Lord lets us know that the heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked. And this man's heart was deceitful. It was desperately wicked. And Nehemiah had to let him know, first of all, you need to understand that I'm not doing this work for myself. I'm staying on purpose doing the things of God. This is about the Lord's business. It ain't my business. This is about him that he may be glorified. And we ain't about to meet. Let's get together. We ain't about to get together because I know what you want to get together about. You want to get together to try to hinder what God has me to do. But I ain't got time for you. Thank That's you. why sometimes you got to be able to have what T.D. Jakes says. You got to have what's called the gift of goodbye. You know, so I love people, but sometimes you got to have the gift of goodbye. I love people, but sometimes that gift of goodbye, I love you, but uh, I got to leave you because everybody ain't trying to go where you trying to go. So I got to give that gift of goodbye. This is the best gift. Goodbye. I love you. Goodbye. I'm going to pray for you, but goodbye. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to look at you. I'm going to pray for you. Goodbye. You know, you got to give them that gift of goodbye and let them know I got to do a work for the Lord. If you're not with me, you're against me. So I got to do what it is that God has for me to do. Verse number nine, for they all said, for they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work that is not that, that it be not done. Now therefore, God strengthen my hands. Now look at this. Everything he was doing was trying to cause fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. He was trying to cause them to be fearful. He was trying to speak to them and say, look, man, your hands are going to get weak. Your hands are going to start shaking. You ain't going to be able to do the work of the Lord. But Nehemiah spoke against that spirit and said, no, Lord, strengthen our hands. Cause us to be mighty men and women of God. Whatever work you started in us, God, finish it. God, give us power. God, even when we want to quit, God, when we want to give up, God, give us strength to continue. The enemy was trying to scare them, but you have have to speak life. You got to speak life and not death. Power of life and death is in your tongue. And you will eat the fruit thereof. You got to speak life or you got to speak death. And for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord and we're going to speak life. life. And we ain't going to speak death. We're going to be strengthened. We ain't going to be weak. I don't care what the enemy has to say. Verse number 10. Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, and the son of Hetabel, who was shut up. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within a temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. Verse 11, And I said, Should such a man as I flee, and, is, and who is there that being as I am would... Yeah, hold on, yeah, hold on, I'm reading it, you got to capitalize, all right. That being as I am would go into the temple to save his life. I will not go in. Now scroll back up because I wanted to talk about this one. Now right here, Shemaiah, this is very interesting. Somebody who was very close to him, a friend of him, came to him and said, man, let us go to the temple. Let us go to the house of God. Let us get shut up in this temple because there are people that's coming out to kill you and trying to take you out. Shemaiah was a pretended prophet and friend. He was a pretended 
prophet, and friend. The devil will hire the people closest to you to try to stop the work of God that God is doing in you. He will hire a Judas who will sell you out for 30 pieces of silver. Oh, you want to know where those SBOCers are? Oh, I know where they are. They're over there in mortgage. I'll show you where they are. He will hire that Judas to try to stop the work of God and the will of God and what God is doing. You got to be careful and watch out for those Judases that are trying to hinder you in what God wants to do in your life. He was trying to give him advice, but again, you got to be careful, unless he was confirming it. You got to be careful of the advice that people give. Everybody ain't giving you sound advice. The advice that he was trying to give was an advice to try to hinder the move of God, the plans of God, the work of God. He was trying to get uh, Nehemiah to maximize that, look, man, they about to slay your life. Man, you got to look at this. You can't look at all this other stuff. You got to look at this, man. They trying to take you out, just like the devil did with Adam and Eve in the beginning. He got them to maximize that one little tree that God said, look, look you can eat everything. There could have been a million trees in the garden, y'all. It could have been a million trees in there. And he's going to get Eve. Look, man, God, God said, you can't even eat it at one tree over there. And you sitting there focusing on the one tree you can't eat, and there's a million of them over there, and he got you to where you focusing on on that one tree, like, yeah, man, God trying to keep something from you. That's why you got to be careful of the advice because the enemy is trying to sabotage the work of God. That's why it's so important to stay on purpose. Quitting is not an option. And we got to understand, I put up there Proverbs 14, 11 and 14. It says, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. In the multitude of counselors, meaning the counselors of those who are of God, those who are moving by God, who God has put in place, the multitude of counselors, not just one. Shemaiah wasn't a true counselor. He wasn't a true man of God. He was being deceitful. That's why you have to always walk in the Holy Ghost because an uh, enemy real quickly, like I said, will use somebody close to you and if you're not aware, he will use that person to sabotage what God is trying to do in your life. And as I read verse number 11, look how Nehemiah responded. And I said, should such a man as I flee, and who was there being as I am, would go into the temple to save his life. Understand that only the priests were allowed to go into the temple. Only the priests were allowed. And what was happening is he was trying to get Nehemiah to go into the temple to cause him to bring about trouble to where it would discredit Nehemiah. Because they saw him going in, and only the priest was supposed to be going in. Oh, this is going to discredit your witness. This is going to discredit you. See, you say you're doing that work from God. Oh, no, no. See, you out of order. See, you you in a place you ain't supposed to be. You out of position. Now, we're going to discredit you. That's why you got to stay on purpose and be mindful of what the enemy is trying to do. There are times on this campus, and I thank the Lord for the experiences like Leslie talks about, because you got to have wisdom. And there's been times on this campus when people come in, and I'm not going to mention a person's name because I love them, but Chris knows who this person is. There's been times when I came on this campus and there will be uh, people that come in and first get saved and I just love God. And a friend of mine, he, uh, he came in, he got saved, man, and he just wanted to share the gospel with people. And there would be times when, you know, he was tall, he was athletic, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, he had some girls that would be after him here and there, you know what I'm saying? But they weren't saved. He was saved. And there would be times where he might get that phone call like, hey, such, such, you come over and uh, we can pray and read the Bible together, you know what I'm saying? I want you to help give me better understanding of the word of God. Yeah, man, you want me to do, man, I, I come up right now, man. And he was so on fire. It's like 12, 1 o'clock at night. And it's, they want him to come over. And mind you, they used to like the person. So he on his way over there. And I've advised him. See, me and Carl advised them about going over there. And he would go over there. And then he find himself in a situation where he get there. And then now he can't get out. And she in there taking all her clothes off. And now he had hemmed up. And he ended up coming out like, you know, I come talking to him. Like, dude, man, what happened? Like, man, she had me hemmed up. And I couldn't get out. And man, I, man, and I said, well, first of all, <laughs> you six foot two, six three, about two twenty. This girl about five foot, maybe a hundred ten. And you mean to tell me this girl had you hemmed up? You couldn't get out of the room? And she just, she didn't, she didn't want to share the word. She didn't want to hear the word. She wanted some other ministry for you to give to her. And I said, dude, this is why you have to take wisdom. You got to be able to discern. And she really wanted you to come over there right now at 1 o'clock to share the word of God or she wants something else. 
And you got to have the wisdom. And me and Carl was trying to give him the wisdom. And Carl had to learn it the hard way as well. He was more seasoned in the Lord. But he did, he wasn't really discerning either. And this, after I heard his story and, and Carl's story, you know, it, it really taught me something about <laughs> really being mindful. Because Carl, about 5'7", he was kind of skinny. Got caught up in the same thing. He was coming over to kind of, you know, minister to somebody. And it was this girl whose name will remain anonymous. But uh, she was about six foot one and uh, very athletic, very athletic. And she got him in that room and she had him hemmed up and he tried to get out. This girl was strong. She wrapped her legs around him and she let him know, I'm going to get what I can. And she had him in there. And the man had already been at work all day. He'd been in class, everything. And she had him hemmed up. By the grace of God, he got up out of there and he came to Dabney Hall where I was working at. It was like 2 in the morning. I was sitting at the desk. Like, man, what's going on, man? Like, man, she such and such. She's a very popular name. I even say, you know, a popular name, you know, that we all know. But she had him hemmed up, and I said, man, after I heard both stories, and as I was working on this Bible study, man, I was more motivated than ever to get myself back in shape, because it was, you know, I love my sister, but there's some strong women out here, and they had them hemmed up, and Carl, about 5'7", he weighed a little bit more than me, and she had him hemmed up. I'm like, man, I ain't about to get hemmed up by anybody. That's why, you know, if anybody called me up at any hour of the night, and it, you know, it might be kind of suspicious, like, Brother Antoine, I need you to come over here. I need you to, we need to have a Bible, so we need to have prayer together. You know what I'm saying? I need some breakthrough. I need some deliverance, some break from some stuff I'm dealing with. If I'm discerning that there's something else going on, I may be discerning. I may say, well, uh, uh, well what I'm feeling is that deliverance that you really need. So you need some special deliverance. You know what I'm doing? I'm going to go ahead and pass your number on to Sister Monica. <laughs> you want to get free from tonight is some, is some ministry that's only supposed to take part in the context of marriage. And that's not my ministry or the services I provide. The devil is but that blood spirit, you're going to get delivered from it. Let me get your sister my number right now. It's 513. And just in case they sleep, I'm going to pray right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, wake them up right now. So this is how Nehemiah got the people together. He got the people, uh, he got Shemaiah together. Like, who am I that I should go in and do this thing? And look what he said here, y'all. We almost done here. Just a few scriptures. And he said, look right here. This is why it's important staying on purpose. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him. But that he pronounced this prophecy against me. For Tobiah and Sambalai had hired him. I perceive, I discern when I'm walking in the purpose and the plans of God and I decide that I'm not going to quit. Quitting is not an option. God will put something in me to be able to discern that you're not, you not in the will of God. You're trying to stop the work of God, what God is trying to do in me. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin that they might have a matter for an evil report that they might reproach me again. He was hired to try to be used as an enemy to try to bring a reproach against me. He was hired to try to cause me to be fearful of who it is God has called me to be. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He was trying to get me to doubt who it was God has called me to be. Doubt who God wants me to be. For me to be doubted as the man of God or the woman of God or what it is God has planted in me. He was trying to do harm to me. But I understand who it is God has called me to be. And I refuse to allow what the enemy is trying to do to hinder me. What the enemy wants you to do is to look back and to remind you of your past failures. To cause you to think like, remember that one time when God didn't answer that prayer? When God didn't move for you on that one time? You prayed that prayer and God didn't answer you? Trying to maximize like that garden of Eden. That maximize that one prayer that you feel like God didn't answer. But all, forget about all the other prayers that God didn't answer for you. Not realizing that that prayer that he might not have answered may have been for your own good because you could have had some nonsense 
sense that you was praying for. And God, because he loves you, God said, okay, I'm not going to answer that prayer because what you have in mind does not line up with what I have in mind for your life. In verse 14, for my God, think upon Tobiah and Sambalot according to these works and on the prophetess. Nodiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. So uh, Nehemiah doesn't curse him. He said, God, I want you to think upon these things that these people are doing. I want you to be mindful of God because you know everything that's going on right now. I want you to be mindful of what they're doing right now. I want you to be mindful of how they're trying to stop the work of God. I want you to be mindful of how they're trying to stop your will and the purpose that you have put in my heart. They're trying to stop. They're trying to get me to quit. And I understand quitting is not an option. I didn't sign up to quit. I signed up to endure all the way to the end. I signed up to do the things that God would have me to do. And so he didn't curse them that Jesus taught us. Jesus taught us, don't, don't curse your enemy, but pray for those that spitefully use you. Because at the end of the day, the Lord said, vengeance is mine and I'm going to repay that. Everyone that tried to hinder you, every enemy that tried to bring you down, that tried to stop the will of God, when I get done with them, they're going to be your footstool. They thought they got the best of you, but I'm going to put them under you and they're going to be that footstool that lifts you up to the place that God would have you to be. And look at this, verse 15. So the wall was finished. In the 20 and 5th day of the month of Elu, in 15 and 2 days, it said that the wall was finished on the 52, the 52nd day. And understand, the month of Elihu was the time of repentance, y'all. Wow. It was the time of repentance. They had a work that needed to be done because there was coming a time where God was calling for repentance. And that's why you got to stay on purpose because there's a time, there's a season where God is pouring out, where there is a harvest coming in and there is not, there's not an option to quit because there is a time that God is going to be pouring out where repentance is going to be coming from every place and they finished this work. At any other time, this would have taken months and years. When you study this text, it would have taken them years to get this done. But in 50 two days they finished the work it's showing how God can speed up the work and cause it to be finished quicker than what it was supposed to because he has a time clock he has a work that he wants to do and he will cause it to be sped up so that repentance and deliverance can come forth so that breakthrough can come forth in the last verse verse 16 Scroll up, Jonathan. it's the last verse and it came to pass that when all our enemies heard and all the heathen that were about saw these things, they were much cast down, meaning they were afraid in their own eyes. For they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. When we made up our mind that we was going to stay on purpose and that quitting wasn't an option, when they saw what God did, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't just about hearing what God did. Oh, God going to do some stuff you won't hear about. But God said, I'm going to show you. If you ain't going to just hear about I heard y'all was doing some stuff. No, I'm going to show you. I'm going to manifest. I'm going to show my glory. I'm going to show you that if you don't quit and you understand about staying on purpose and doing the things that I will do in you, I'm going to cause your enemies to be afraid of not, it's not just you they're afraid of. They're going to realize that of the God that you serve. That your God that you serve is an awesome God. That he is a mighty God. That he can do anything but fail. That no matter what attack that the enemy tries to throw at you, he cannot stop what it is God has started in you. If God has started something in you, all he's really doing is kicking against the pricks. He ain't going to be able to hinder what God is doing. If anything, God is going to run him over like a lawnmower and he's the grass. God going to mow right on over him and keep on going cutting the rest of the grass. And he's going to be sitting there dead somewhere. And it will show how powerful our God is. For they perceive that this was the work of God. So this again, it encourages us with what Leslie said and what I said today about the importance of staying on purpose. Staying on purpose and understanding it's about like Leslie said, salvation and souls being saved, doing the things God has called us to do, and staying on doing the work God would have us to do, and not quitting, because quitting is not an option. No matter what the enemy throws at us, no matter how he discourages you, no matter if family or people try to make you feel bad, or try to push you down or spit on you and talk about you, let them talk about you. You got to stay on purpose, say, I'm about my father's business. There's gonna be people that's gonna talk about me, like Leslie said. 
people had talked about Jesus, but Jesus didn't worry about all that stuff. Like, I got a work to do. Not my will, but your will be done. I got work to do. I can't worry about people that's talking about me. If they got all that time in the world to talk about me, obviously I'm going to be somebody. Obviously I got, I ain't somebody. If you ain't got nothing else better to do with your time to talk about me, and y'all all ain't got nothing together to talk about me, obviously I must be important. Because if I wasn't important, you wouldn't be talking about me. So obviously I got work to do. Keep on talking. Matter of fact, we need to do more work so more of you can talk about me. But the more you talk about me, the more I'm going to want to work even harder. Amen. Showing that I'm doing this for long. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. Amen. So stay on purpose. Quitting is not an option. Amen. Amen. Amen.